Welcome to the Science Center live stream. We're doing our animal update today. My name is Fred Hartman. I am the director of guest programs here at Liberty Science Center. And we're going to be visiting some of our animals that we have here today, uh, checking in on them, seeing how they're doing, seeing what they've been up to. And joining me right now is our green winged macaw, Mickey. Mickey, how are you doing this morning? I'm getting a uh, nod from my producer, Pesh. Are we, are we doing okay, Pesh? Yeah, Let's we had a see. small glitch in connection, but I, we're back again. Right, we're back again. I think we're back. Hopefully yep. everyone can see and hear me. So Mickey is a green winged macaw from northern and central South America, where he lives in forested regions. He uh, is a full-grown macaw. They get to be about three feet tall. They have a massive wingspan of up to three and a half feet. Uh, he is, uh, as a macaw, they are long-limbed animals as well. They can live over 60 years. And actually, macaw, uh, Mickey here is older than I am. He's 39 years old. He was born in 1981. He's been here at the Science Center for many years. Now, you will, one of his most striking features are those beautiful colorations and those gorgeous feathers he has. And that's actually camouflage. And you might think, well, that's, that doesn't seem right, right? These bright colors, he stands out. But in the rainforest, where there's lots of fruit and flowers and brightly, the bright green leaves, that is excellent camouflage for him. And he's demonstrating another one of those amazing abilities. He has that beak of his. Super, super powerful. In fact, he can bite down at 2,000 PSI. 2,000 pounds per square inch. And he uses that for cracking open really hard nuts. And it's so strong, he can even bite a broomstick in half. Wow. And he's uh, playing around with some of his toys right now. Uh, we give him lots of enrichment items. So he's got some wooden blocks here. And that helps to keep him stimulated. He loves to play with toys. And it also helps to keep his beak sharp. It's really important he has a sharp beak. And we have some nuts in there in that bowl of his, so hopefully he'll take some nuts out and show us how easily he can crack a nut. Oh, we have a question. Oh, we all, we're already we're starting to get questions. Go ahead. Uh, Christy wants to know what's his favorite food? What's his favorite food? He loves nuts and fruit, all kinds of different nuts and fruit. And he has, it's probably going to be hard to see on the live stream, but he has a tongue that he uses to manipulate those nuts inside uh, when he has it in his beak. And because of that, because he doesn't have hands to hold it, he's a very messy eater. And you might see all over the ground already, he's only been out for a couple minutes, but he's got a mess all over the ground. And that's actually really important for the forest because that is one of the ways that he helps distribute seeds so that new plants can grow. Uh, partly from that chewing, he's a very messy eater. And he also sometimes when he eats them, doesn't fully digest the seeds. So when he uh, goes to the bathroom, when he uh, is, uh, oops, oops, some of those undigested seeds will land and also be able to grow. Are we, are we getting another question? Yeah, we're getting a bunch. Uh, awesome the, so Amanda has asked, does he miss his guests at LSE? Yes, he definitely misses his guests. So the, I was talking to our animal keeper staff here, and they were saying the first few days, um, they think he was maybe enjoying a little bit of a break from all the hustle and bustle here at the Science Center. But since then, the last month or so, he has really been missing everybody. Uh, he's a very intelligent animal. He really enjoys the, the attention. He really enjoys having people around him. It gives him a lot of stimulation. And he has really been missing everybody. Fortunately, we have our animal husbandry staff, our animal keepers are here every single day, so they always spend some time with him every day, give him lots of toys, give him lots of attention, so he's not feeling too lonely. So how old is he? Because Diane, Diana wants to know how old Mickey is. All right, he is 39 years old. He was born wow. in 1981, so he's even older than I am. Uh, 1981, they can live, though, over 60 years old. So he is, even though he's 39 years old, he has a long life still to live. They're very long-lived birds. Uh, Renzo wants to know, how many colors do you think he has on his feathers? Oh, well, I guess that, let's see, we, we can count. We've got certainly the red, very striking red. 
He has white all around his face, and that's actually bare skin. And he has that bare skin on his, on his cheeks because where he's from, it's very hot, and he can actually dissipate heat from there. On his wings, he has blue. And of course, he has a, a nice streak of green. He is a green, green macaw, after all. Uh, they are the second largest macaws in the world, second only to the highest macaw. And he is a full-grown boy, but he's a male. And the males do get bigger than the females. So it seems That's, like... Uh, I should have said that from the beginning. If you have any questions, uh, please send them in. We'll try and answer as many of them as we can. So it seems like he's playing with some wooden pieces. Uh, we have a question. What is his favorite toys? What is his favorite toys? Well, you know what he... More so than a favorite toy, but I think he really likes is a variety. He mm. likes to get lots of different toys all the time. So we have some wooden blocks here. I'm not going to touch his toys because he doesn't like that because uh, they're his toys. He's got some different types and colors of wooden blocks. He has... Um, some different, almost, uh, I'm showing off that wow. impressive up yeah. to three and a half foot wingspan. I think he thinks I'm, I might be after his toys. Don't worry, I'm not going to touch your toys, Mickey. They're, I know you're in charge here. He's got some cardboard. Uh, he might get different types of foods that uh, help stimulate him. Another one that he really likes is he has a cardboard box mm. back uh, where he normally stays that he likes to hang out inside his cardboard box and he can rip that up. But he likes to get a, a different variety of toys. And you, you'll see these toys here. And these were, we just gave them to him these maybe not even 10 minutes ago. And we have to give him new toys every day because by the end of the day, he will destroy all his toys. He will, he will shred them all, rip them up. And that's really good for him because it helps to keep his beak strong and sharp. And it's really, really critical he have a strong, sharp beak because he needs it in order to eat those really hard nuts that he likes to eat. All right. So... I think we can take one more question for Mickey. How long has he been an LSE ambassador? He has been here for quite a few years. He's uh, certainly one of um, the most popular animals we have in the Science Center. He's, uh, he, and he knows it. He's, he knows how big of a star he is. He's got a huge ego. Uh, but he's been here for quite a few years now. He, not his entire life. Uh, so he wasn't hatched here. He wasn't born here. Uh, but he has been here for quite a while now. I, I believe about six years. All right, uh, and I'm one, one question that I'm getting a lot, actually two questions I'm getting a lot, and then we can move on is, okay. can he talk? Oh, and what a great question. Can he fly? Okay, uh, both excellent <laughs> questions. Right on cue there, he's going to make that sound. Uh, he can talk, but not like you might think of parrots as really, uh, really talking like people. So he can say a couple words, he can say his name, he can say hello, maybe he'll say his name, hello Mickey. Hello? Hello? No, I'm not sure. I'm not sure he's in a talking mood today. <laughs> but he can say a couple words, but not as well as some of uh, some of the other parrots you might think of. But you'll hear he's very vocal. He makes a lot of sounds. Uh, and he hasn't done it quite yet, but he can make a really loud, almost screaming sound. And they can get so loud that it's over a hundred decibels, which is equal to, say, a motorcycle or a snowmobile. Uh, and the reason why he needs to have such a loud screech is because he lives in a, he would normally live in a dense forest and that would help to communicate with other birds and other trees. As far as if he can fly, uh, he does have some ability to fly. As you can see, he's uh, not apt to do it. He feels way more secure and comfortable on his perch. So he can flop around a little bit. He's not a strong flyer, just he's, he's lived his whole life. Um, in captivity prior to coming here. So he's not a very strong flyer. He can flop around a little bit. He is way, way uh, more comfortable um, on his perch. But I think we're going to say goodbye to Mickey, and we might actually, as we walk away, it's, uh, he loves the attention, so the moment we walk away, might, we might actually hear him do that scream, so listen out for it. But we're going to head over and check out our naked molars. So we're here in our Eat Beaten Gallery. Did you hear it? You might have just heard him. There he is. <laughs> that very loud scream. Right on cue. <laughs> unmistakable. And we're going to head on over here to our naked boards. 
Uh, we have one of our animal keepers, Heidi, in there. We'll wave to Heidi. There's Heidi. And Heidi's actually going to be giving them some food while we're here. So hopefully you can see them all bunched together and begin to eat some of their food. Now these are naked mole rats. They come from East Africa. Uh, there they live underground in typically grasslands, savannas, areas like that. And that's where they would find their food is underground. They like to eat roots, tubers, bulbs, uh, plant life you would find underground. And you can see Heidi is giving them some food right now. There's some uh, different, uh, one of their favorites is corn on the cob. On the video you probably can really, really see that corn on the cob. That is definitely a big favorite of theirs. And hopefully they'll, they'll sense that that food is there and they'll come right out. Now naked mole rats, they have that word naked because it looks like they're completely hairless. It's actually not entirely true. They do have very small hairs on their bodies and that is how they sense the world around them. Now, living underground in the darkness, they don't have strong eyesight. They're not blind, but they don't have strong eyesight. It's just not something very important um, for an animal that lives underground. They do have a sense of smell, they do have a sense of hearing, their hearing is also not very strong, but they have an amazing sense of touch. And that, that sense of touch comes from those small hairs on their body, and that's really how they're sensing the vibrations in the world around them. Jennifer wants to know what color they are. What color are they? They're, uh, I'm not sure how well you can see it on the video, but they're uh, kind of a pinkish, brownish mix of color. And do they have any predators? They do have predators. So they live underground. So um, most predators, say like birds, things like that, they don't have to worry about. But their main predator are snakes, which can get down into their burrows. Now, naked mole rats are unique as far as mammals go in that they live, there's something called eusocial. Now, eusocial means that there's a female, a queen. She is the only one in the colony who breeds, and all the rest take care of the young and do the work for the colony. Now, that is ab uh, abnormal for mammals and something you much more see commonly in insects. So bees, uh, ants have organization like that, but so do these naked mole rats. In the wild, there would typically be one queen. She does all the breeding. In captivity, it is not unusual to have two queens in a colony. And in fact, that's what we have here. So our colony of naked mole rats actually has two queens. They will, uh, they're the only ones who have the babies. They're the only ones who breed. Their litter size is typically around 11, though they can have up to over 20 pups in a litter. And they can do that multiple times a year. And in fact, a naked mole rat queen in her lifespan may be mother to over 900 pups. And a naked mole rat colony can be as large as 300 individuals. Our colony here is not nearly that big, but we do have quite a few of them. I believe at our, I was talking to our animal keepers this morning, they said we're up to 55 naked mole rats here. And I think we're getting a question. Yes, so how, um, so a lot of people want to know that they generally could live, they generally have to live underground. So what is the environment like inside this enclosure? So the enclosure here, they have um, kind of almost like a, a clear PVC pipes or tunnels that they're able to travel through. And then there are these clear uh, chambers where that's where they sleep, that's where their food goes, that's where they take care of their young. And this recreates in a lot of ways what a colony might look like with those different chambers and tunnels. They are, they are okay dealing with the light here, they're adapted to that. So of, of course in the wild underground they would be completely in the dark, but uh, they are okay with it here. They, their eyelids are actually, if they close their eyelids, um, are almost entirely impervious to light. So the light doesn't really bother them. And this, this in, uh, enclosure we have for them is very specially built. It's actually also built to minimize vibrations. So when we have lots of guests walking around the building, you can imagine it shakes the ground a little bit 
and this enclosure here actually minimizes that to keep them comfortable. And they're doing very, very well here. In fact, they've uh, the colony has grown quite a bit since they arrived here, so we know that they're they're very happy and healthy here. And I think we're are we getting another question? Yeah. So Augie wants to know how old they are, and uh, Cody wants to know do they make any noises? Okay. Well, I'll, let, let me do the noises first, and then we'll get to how old they are because that's a very interesting question. So they do make sounds. They can make some different sounds. Uh, like I was saying earlier, they actually don't have super strong hearing, but they are able to make sounds that they're able to use to communicate. They really communicate more uh, through touch and through smell than through sound. As far as how old they are, so we have individuals here ranging uh, many different ages, but the age of naked mole rats is something that scientists really study. So even though there's these small uh, little mammals about the size of maybe say a large mouse, smaller than a chipmunk, they can live up to 30 years which is very, very abnormal, very strange for such a small animal to be able to live that long. If you think about a mouse, they're only living a couple of years. These guys can live up to 30 years. And it's one of the many things scientists are studying about them to find out some of their secrets of how they're such a small animal is able to live so long. A few other things that scientists are studying, they have an incredible ability to uh, handle pain they are able to survive in very, very low oxygen environments, which of course makes sense when you live underground. And maybe most interesting of all, they are nearly immune to cancer. They have a genetic mutation, we believe, that makes them nearly immune to cancer. Wow. You can imagine that we have a uh, scientists have a lot of interest in studying that and finding out how they're able to do that. So Aiden wants to know, does the queen have a specific area that she lives in or does she just, is she just part of the group? Uh, so she does, not, she does not just have one chamber that she doesn't leave. She does move around. The, they tend to change chambers uh, that they're sleeping in. So they might be sleeping in one chamber uh, later today and then the next time they might choose a different one to sleep in. Our animal keepers also keep them very interested and stimulated You'll, uh, by where they feed them. So you'll see that uh, Heidi put that food in those two chambers, but they can put them in different chambers. In fact, they're able to open up every chamber in here and just give them some different, different things to do, different places to go uh, to keep them interested. Um, all right, uh, last question. Uh, is there a particular food they have to eat? Like, why do they like corn? Uh, that is one of the questions I see. So in the wild, they since they spend almost their entire lives, and most of them will spend their entire lives underground, they typically eat the underparts of plants, so roots, tubers, um, bulbs, things like that. So we give them foods like that, but there are also other foods that they do enjoy that give them all um, some really good nutritional value, and they do seem to really enjoy corn on the cob. So. We want it's uh, good for them. It's something they enjoy, so we provide that for them. All right. Well, last last question. Uh, last because last I question. I really want All to right. know what this is as well. Cody says, "When do they sleep? Do they follow like a normal sleep pattern, or do they sleep at night? Do they sleep during the day? What is their sleep pattern like?" What an excellent question. So, if you live underground and you live in a world of perpetual darkness, there is no day and night, right? So, if, when you live in a tunnel. There is no day and night, so uh, in the wild, that's not something they worry about. That's called like a circadian rhythm. They don't have that. They just sleep when they want to, and they're active at other times when they want to, and it doesn't matter what time of day it is to us, because to them, it's all the same thing. Now here, of course, they do have the lights that come on and off. Uh, they do have some natural sunlight that comes into the gallery. But they will sleep randomly throughout the day, and a lot of times they form big piles uh, that they, they love to sleep together, so they like to sleep together in very large groups. Before we move past the naked mole rats, the last thing I want to mention is on our website, there is a live cam to our naked mole rats that's on 24-7, so you can check that out. Uh, anytime you want to see what our naked mole rats are up to, check that out. But I think we're going to move on to our next... All right, getting one more look at them as they're eating. And one more we'll look at them. Move on. Loving that corn. All right. 
They're not making the same noise as Mickey made. No, no, definitely not nearly as loud as Mickey. All right, here we're gonna we're gonna take a look at our black spot piranha. And actually, not only are we gonna take a look at our black spot piranha, but we're going to do a feeding for them. Uh, for everybody here. So we're going to be feeding those piranha in one moment. You'll see that food fall in. These guys are from, also from South America, just like Mickey was. They come from mainly Venezuela, uh, also Colombia. They live in freshwater streams, rivers, lakes. They're freshwater fish. You can see these guys are pretty much just about full grown. They get to be about 10 inches long. They get to be about two to three pounds in weight. But of course, what everyone always thinks of when they think of piranhas is piranhas feeding. And I think I saw one of our keepers head back there. So at any point now, you might see that. That uh, I think it, here it comes. Here it comes. Oh. All right, you see those piranha teeth in action. Look at them slice through that. So what they are eating right now, oh, look how, much, look how quickly they went through that. That is uh, tilapia. So it's a fish a lot of you probably are familiar with. Now piranha are mostly fish eaters. That is mostly what they eat. They will eat other things, especially invertebrates, crustaceans. Um, they will sometimes have uh, go after birds and plants, things like that. Of course, they have a very fearsome reputation, right? And that is a little bit of fact and a whole lot of fiction when it comes to piranhas. So a lot of the fiction from piranhas as these fearsome fish that will actively attack people and cattle and things like that comes from a book written by Teddy Roosevelt uh, during his travels to South America. And really, piranha are not prone to attacking people. It's just not what they do. Uh, they, it's not possible, though. If they're threatened, they certainly will lash out. And if there's a time where maybe they're um, really hard on for food, it's the dry season, then it, it also they, they might take a bite. Uh, but it's very rare. It's not really how they uh, operate. They'll also scavenge too, All which right. is where I think a lot of the tales come from. I think we're getting a question. We are. Uh, a lot of people want to know, do you know how many teeth they might have? So I, I couldn't tell you exactly how many teeth they have, but I can tell you a lot about the teeth. The teeth are, and you probably saw just how quickly they ripped through that tilapia, are very, very sharp. So that part of the, of the piranha tail is true. They have incredibly razor sharp teeth that are perfectly designed for slicing, much like some uh, sharks. I think maybe if we take a step back, I think they're not used to us here, so they're getting a little, a little scared there. We'll take a step back and maybe they'll go after some of that tilapia again. Uh, they have razor, razor sharp teeth and very powerful jaw muscle, muscles. Uh, they are capable of, say, slicing through a small finger, things like that. But also very similar to sharks is, well, is they replace their teeth throughout their lives. However, they don't drop out individually like a shark does usually. They replace them more in groups, so they always have a mouthful of razor sharp teeth. We have a question from Sophie uh, who says, how much do they eat a day? How much do they eat a day? Uh, you know, so they're fish, so they're uh, a cold-blooded animal. So they're not like us where they have to eat three square meals a day and make, and make sure uh, they maintain that, that warm body temperature. So we uh, here typically feed them not even every day necessarily. They get a different, different amounts of food, they sometimes, or different types of food, I should say. Sometimes they get fish like uh, you're seeing right now. Sometimes they may get some crayfish to pick on. They really love that. That gives them something to chase around. But they don't even necessarily eat every day. You just saw that they all just took some bites of that tilapia, uh, and that might be good for them for, for a bit. They, they just don't really need that uh, nearly as much food as, say, a mammal or a bird, a warm-blooded animal might need. They are in the, in the wild, typically ambush predators, which is another part of the, the fictional tale of the piranha. They're not just in giant uh, shoals of fish cruising around looking to attack people or anything. They typically hang out in vegetation and they wait for, say, a uh, fish to come by and then they'll shoot out 
and take a bite out of that fish or try and eat that fish. They're not, while they do like to stay in groups, it does help their hunting and for protection. They're not just in these big active um, shoals and groups of fish mm. just cruising around rivers looking to attack things. It's really not true. So do they have a leader? Does, do they follow a leader? They don't necessarily have a leader. Um, so unlike, say, our naked mole rats who have a queen uh, and the next animal we're going to say, uh, see who uh, have very distinct social hierarchies, not really. Uh, so in the fish world, size is typically everything. So your larger fish are going to be the more dominant ones uh, over the smaller ones. They might be the, the ones to get the first bite of a meal or might get to hang out towards the a more protected area, but that mm. they don't really necessarily have a social structure in a in a very strong sense. It's more more size will probably determine determine things like that. I'm getting a bunch of questions about how do they sleep? How do they sleep? So fish do sleep. Uh, they do sleep. They don't have necessarily eyelids, so they don't close their eyes to sleep. But they'll go into um, a mode where they're maybe just kind of, I don't want to say floating, not up and up, say, towards the top, but they'll just kind of stay very still. They still have to pump water across their gills. They have to do that constantly in order to breathe. But they'll go into, say, like a sleep mode where they're not active. They're not actively swimming around. They're just staying still, just resting. But it wouldn't necessarily look like sleep to us because they're not, say, they're not closing their eyes and going into a blanket or anything like that. But they, they will go into a, a rest state. All right. All right. So that was, we're going to leave our piranha behind and we're going to go check out our last animal of the day. We saved one of the very best for the last. We're going to check on our cotton top tamarins. We see Heidi again. So Heidi is setting up a really neat activity for our cotton top tamarins. So cotton top tamarins are a primate. They come from a small area in northern Colombia, so not far necessarily from where we, our piranhas would be from. They live in forested regions. There's something called arboreal which means that they really love to be up in the trees. They're not very comfortable on the ground. They like being up in the trees. They are one of the world's smallest primates. They only stand about eight feet tall, not including the tail. That tail actually can be longer than their body at up, uh, up to a foot in length. And they lay, uh, weigh less than one pound. They are what we call omnivores, which means they like to eat uh, both animal, animal or meat uh, matter and also plants. In their case, mostly they like to eat fruit and they like to eat insects. And the really cool thing that you're seeing them do right now is they're doing a little foraging because Heidi put in some astroturf and inside that astroturf she put something called mealworms, uh, little larva from beetles that have crawled into that astroturf and they really like that. One, they love to eat the mealworms and it's also really interesting and stimulating to them to have to hunt through the astroturf to get them, to have to pick them out there, out of there. They really, really enjoy that. It's a really great enrichment for them. They are primates, so we, uh, it's really important that you're always keeping them stimulated and interested with something new every day. And we do a really great job of that here at the Science Center. Do we know what their lifespan is? So in the wild, their lifespan is around a dozen years, 10 years, 15 years, somewhere around there. However, in captivity, they can live up to 20 years. And how big are their groups or troops? So in the wild, the really, really large troop size is, is getting to around 15 to 20. It's really uh, typically a little bit smaller than that, but they can get up to be up to 15, 20 individuals. Here at the Science Center, our troop is five, and we have two in there right now. And they, have, they are an animal that has a very strict social hierarchy. Uh, their hierarchy is based around the breeding, uh, top breeding pair. So 
there's a male and a female who are really the ones in charge, and really it's even the breeding fe the top breeding female is even the the one really really in charge. She runs the show. Uh, but the other uh, the other tamarins in the group are able to breed. That's okay. That unlike the naked mole rats who can't, they can. And something that is really interesting about these guys as far as their child care is the group does care for the young. So that's not something that's necessarily true in all primates, but it is for them. Typically, uh, they might have, uh, when the young are born, they're almost, in, you, I'm sorry, they're almost always born as twins. So twins are very common for cotton top tamarind. In fact, it's really uh, uncommon not to have twins. In there right now, we have two of them, and you'll see the one on top, who's looking at me right now, that is Annie. And Annie is actually the matriarch. She is the head of the entire troop. She is the one who's in charge. And the one who's right now in the astroturf is one of her daughters. That's Amelia. So, Amelia does have a sister, and she also has a, a set of brothers. So why, is, why do they have a black and white color? Is it to evade predators? So the black and white color, uh, certainly that might help them camouflage somewhat. Uh, it also helps to maybe tell individuals apart. Since they do live in groups, it's really important that they, they know who's who. Do they more, have more importantly than that, though, is their vocalizations. Mm -hmm. So they have a very large, what we might call a vocabulary. They make up to nearly 40 different unique sounds. Uh, in fact, they can even chain some sounds together to create what we might consider sentences. And that vocabulary is so impressive that they even have different sounds for different predators. So say they saw a large boa constrictor or a snake. They would have a call for that, and that would be different than say a call for, say they saw a hawk or an eagle a raptor, a predatory bird, and that helps them to distinguish what to be on the lookout for, maybe even where they're seeing that predator, and that's really, really important. Voc vocal communication, very, very important for our tamarins. And do they, they seem to be loving to play and jump around. Do we know how far they can jump, and do they love to play just like all the time? Uh, so I, I have not ever gone in there with a tape measure to measure just kind of how far they can jump. You can see they certainly have no trouble at all leaping around across on their branches and their ropes. Uh, they can definitely clear several several times their own body length, which is about, as, like I said, about that eight inches. But they have no trouble uh, jumping quite a bit further than that. I couldn't give you an exact number, but they, they're very, very well adapted for living in the trees, so they have no trouble at all doing that. Um, one thing they can't do is you'll see they have with those amazing long tails, they use that for balance, but it's not prehensile. So some monkeys, you know, uh, can grab onto branches with that tail, but they're not able to do that. So they can't use that tail as an extra hand like some other monkeys do. And I'm sorry, I forgot the second part of that question. Uh, do they love to play? Do they love to play? Yes, they're very active. They don't do well with boredom. Uh, that's not something primates do well with. I'm sure everybody at home can relate to that as uh, everyone's been home. Um, if, you're, if you're not being stimulated, if you're not having some activities to do, you can, uh, you can just imagine what the, that is like very relatable right now. So our husbandry staff works very, very hard to uh, give them some new enrichment and new items all the time, every day, multiple times a day. And they don't give them the same things every day either. They switch it up so that they are always doing something new. All right, everybody. I want to thank you all so much for joining us for our animal update. If you enjoyed this, then you're uh, in luck because we're going to be doing this every Wednesday morning at 11 for the foreseeable future. We'll check out some different animals every single week. You'll get a chance to see what our animals are up to. We have over a hundred different species here at Liberty Science Center, so you never know what we'll be checking in on. Um, so please, make, please, everybody at home, stay safe. Um, make sure you're uh, keeping those hands clean, doing that social distancing, and hopefully we'll see you all again very soon. Thanks a lot, everybody.